is just fantastic. Captain's Log, Subdates 22022.4. Within the ISO cubes, there is a clear and obvious hierarchy. At the top, you have the Crips, because the Bloods were annihilated. And at the bottom, you have the politicians. Yeah, even political figures rank lower than the sex offenders. Who'd have believed it? Welcome everyone to the Halls of Injustice. Today we welcome inmates number 116 to the ISO cubes. Inmate 116's name is... Nazir Ahmed, or to give him his full title, Ish. The Lord Ahmed, Baron Ahmed, the Right Honourable Life Peer Ahmed. Some of those titles are no longer applicable, but one is Life Peer. Although according to his wiki, he is still listed as The Lord Ahmed. He's going to be here for a while, by the way. So what we're going to do today, before we welcome him to the ISO cubes fully, is go through who he is, the crime he committed, Although for the sake of it, we'll go through the other crimes, because there's some that predates the more recent, during his uh, Who Is He segment? Yeah. Along with any fallout and custodial term. Spoiler, there is a custodial term. So to start, who is Nazir Ahmed? Nazir Ahmed was born in 1957 in Pakistan. At the age of 11, his parents migrated to the United Kingdom, where he lived in Rotherham, South Yorkshire. Rotherham, what an interesting place. There's been some rather interesting crimes that have been committed there by, uh, gangs. And no, I don't mean the Chuckle Brothers. While in academia, he excelled in public administration, which he got a degree in. And at the age of 18, he joined the Labour Party. In 1990, he began his political career as a local Labour Party councillor. He then went on in 1993 to become the chair of the South Yorkshire Labour Party, a position he held until 2000. He founded the British Museum Councillors Forum and was a magistrate between 1992 and 2000. He was at the time the town's youngest magistrate. He also would lobby the UK government on the issue concerning Kashmir, which was usually tensions boiled over between Pakistan and India, on Pakistan's behalf. So he would hold anti-India protests outside the Indian Embassy in London, he himself believing that he was so influential he changed the policy of the then Labour government to an extent that, for the first time in British history, Kashmir was discussed on the floor of the conference, a Labour Party conference, I believe. On the 3rd of August 1998, Nazir Ahmed was created a life peer and granted the title of Baron Ahmed of Rotherham. There were claims that he was the first Muslim life peer, uh, but actually he was the third. The other two were Baroness Udin and Lord Ali, who were raised to peerage about, you know, two weeks before him. In 2005, he hosted a book launch in the House of Lords for the controversial Swedish writer Israel Shamir, during which the latter claimed, the Jews like an empire, this love of empire explains the easiness Jews change their allegiance. Simple minds call it treacherous behavior, but it is actually love of empire per se. I wonder how that went down in the House of Lords. For the sake of it, about eight years later, something connected to Jewish people will crop up and we'll get to it soon, I promise. Nazir Ahmed has taken great umbrage with anyone that has been given a, uh, well, honouring that has themselves in any way criticised Islam. That is a recurring theme that has happened over the years, we'll leave it at that. But he did, as a counter, partake in a diplomatic effort in 2007 to secure the release of a teacher called Gillian Gibbons who had allowed her class to name a teddy bear, Muhammad. She was, by the way, released after eight days of a 15-day prison sentence following a presidential pardon. So some of his earlier crimes. On Christmas Day 2007, he was involved in a crash on the M1 motorway near Rotherham, in which a man called Martin died. Martin was attempting to get back to his vehicle from the hard shoulder, where he was struck by Nazir Ahmed, who was driving his Jaguar X-Type. On the 25th of February 2009, Nazir Ahmed was sentenced to 12 weeks in prison, which meant he would serve six in jail and he was disqualified from driving for 12 months. That was an incorrect sentence, by the way. Nazir Ahmed was sending and receiving text messages while driving two minutes before the crash. He was not paying attention to the road. In 2013, the newspaper The Times revealed that Nazir Ahmed had blamed a Jewish conspiracy 
for his driving conviction. In an interview that he gave in Urdu, broadcast on a Pakistan television channel, Nazir had claimed that he was jailed because of pressure on the courts by Jewish-owned media, saying that my case became more critical because I went to Gaza to support Palestinians. My Jewish friends who own newspapers and TV channels opposed this, further alluding to Jewish involvement regarding the judge, claiming that Mr. Justice Wilkie was specifically selected to judge his case, having previously been appointed to the court after helping a Jewish colleague of former Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair during an important case. As a consequence, the Labour Party suspended him, and he spent the remainder of his time as a peer and a lord as non-affiliated. Nazir did claim that he had no recollection of making these comments, but he did later on go on to resign from the Joseph Interfaith Foundation as a result of the allegations, along with him ceasing to be a member of the international expert team of the Institute Research of Genocide Canada. And because he decided to no-show any kind of committee or hearing, he never got the chance to be expelled, he never got the chance to a fair hearing, although it was likely he'd be expelled believing that simply jumping it meant that he was safe. So now that I've painted a picture as to the kind of man he is, all sources pertaining to this will be linked down below. Now we should talk about the more recent crime and how it's gotten input in one of these ISO cubes. Between the years of 1971 and 1974, while Nazir Ahmed himself was a teenager aged between 14 and 17, two incidents took place. And it wasn't until March the 1st, 2019, that Nazir Ahmed was charged with two offences of attempted rape and one offence of indecent assault. The victims at the time were a boy and a girl, both under the age of 13. For one of them, known as Mr. B in an article where he gave an exclusive interview to Julie Bindle, the abuse began when Mr. B was five and continued for five years and only ended when the family moved out of the area in 1972. The issue that Mr. B had was that Nazir was local, they lived in the same neighborhood, and attended the same mosque, and as a result, Mr. B worried not only for himself but for the children, his more notably if he went to the police, being quoted as saying there might be weeks when I would not think about it, and then it would all come flooding back. The Jimmy Savile case was really difficult for me because it was on the news all the time, and I would relate to it myself. Seeing Ahmed in the community was also difficult, which left him feeling like he could not cope. The damage that was done to Mr. B extended beyond the physical and the mental. It ruined his relationship with his mother and father. His father because he blames his father for bringing Nazir Ahmed into the home, and his mother for not noticing that his underwear at the age of five was full of semen, which was directly referenced by Mr. B in the court. That psychological trauma has lived with him to this day. There is another rather traumatic experience to add to this for Mr. B, and that was when he was a boy, there were two others that were abusing him. They were Nazir Ahmed's older brothers, Mohammed Farouk and Mohammed Tariq, who were also charged with indecent assault, but both men were deemed unfit to stand trial. So before we get to the trial aspect and the charges, I do want to now point out, the charges he faced, Nazir Ahmed that is, have to fall within the legal guidelines, and that includes sentencing, for the time that the offence was committed. Obviously we here disagree with this, but of course, guilty sentences usually for me fall in line with the term life. And immediate castration. All participants that were charged in these offences were granted bail to appear at Sheffield Crown Court on the 16th of April 2019. On that date, the trial was fixed to the 2nd of December 2019, with Nazir Ahmed being released on bail. As Mohammed Tariq and Mohammed Farouk were then declared unfit to stand trial, will continue with Nazir on his own. Nazir Ahmed stood trial in February 2021, after the initial dates in 2020 were delayed due to Corona Chan. Nazir Ahmed did deny the allegations that were laid at his feet. Later in the month of February 2021, the jury were discharged for legal reasons, which then led to Nazir Ahmed standing trial again in November 2021, when he continued to deny the allegations against him. During the trial, the victim of the attempted rapes read her own victim personal statement in court, saying, An overwhelming feeling of shame remained with me throughout my childhood and early adult years. 
It was a burden I was made to carry, and it silenced me for many years. It is now time for me to pass that burden to him, the paedophile who I know feels no personal shame, adding that Nazir Ahmed, however, had been publicly now shamed for his actions. I earlier referenced Mr. B. A victim impact statement was read from him as well, also indicating that this, because of the abuse he suffered by all three men, had affected him on a daily basis and left him unable to show affection to his own children, saying, I buried the abuse and carried it with me on my own for years and years. I feel shame because of what these men did to me. This is not about revenge, this is about justice. In mitigation, Imran Khan QC said that Nazir Ahmed had devoted his life to public service and that his fall from grace had been in the full glare of publicity, including a campaign for him to be stripped of his title, saying that very good reputation he has has gone. By the way, an act of parliament would be required to remove that uh, title, that peerage. I'm not entirely sure if that exists though. If it does though, by all means do tell me in the comments. So with this all in mind, and just before we go through the law itself to determine what the sentence should be, I'm going to now tell you the charges he faces based on the time they come from. One offence is buggery, and the others are attempted rapes. For attempted rape, we have to reference the Criminal Justice Act of 2003, where an offence under Section 1 of the Criminal Attempts Act of 1981 of attempting to commit an offence under Section 1 of the Sexual Offences Act of 1956 or Section 1 of the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. I mentioned how the law has to go back to 1970. This is how they've done it. The charge of buggery though is a bit tricky, because buggery could be defined all the way back to the 1533 Act of Buggery, which defined it as an unnatural sexual act against the will of God and man, which was then later defined to only include anal penetration and bestiality. It was in 1828 then replaced with the Offences Against the Person Act, with it remaining a capital offence until the 1860s. But with a bit more digging, buggery actually falls under the Sexual Offences Act of 1956, or contrary to it, saying that this offence is only available in limited circumstances. The offence is available if the act amounted to an assault i.e. it was non-consensual, so non-consensual anal intercourse should be charged as rape for incidents occurring on or after the 3rd of November 1994. The offence is available regardless of consent if the complainant was under 16 when the offence was committed. The minimum age of consent to buggery and certain homosexual acts was reduced from 18 to 16 years in England and Wales on the 8th of January 2001. Acts of buggery involving a 16 or 17 year old complainant taking place between the 3rd of November 1994 and the 8th of January 2001 are still capable of being prosecuted. However, unless circumstances are exceptional, it is unlikely to be in the public interest. The consent of the DPP is required for proceedings against any male for offences of buggery for aiding, abetting, counselling, procuring or commanding those offences whether either male was under the age of consent. The sentence potentially for the crime is up to 10 years imprisonment for the second charge, that is, as attempted rape falls under the rape category, the offence ranges between 4 to 19 years in custody. So with this in mind, let us get to the verdict and any subsequent statements from the judge. Nazir Ahmed, inmates number 116, was found guilty of buggery and many accounts of attempted rape. With that, we come to a judge's statement before sentencing. The judge said that the offences were so serious that only a custodial sentence can be justified, saying that your actions have had a profound and lifelong effect on the girl and the boy who have lived with what you did to them for between 46 and 53 years. The statements which they have made express more eloquently than I ever could how your actions have affected and continue to affect their lives in so many different and damaging ways. So with this in mind, we now come to the sentence. Inmates number 116, aka Lord Nazir Ahmed, was sentenced to three and a half years for the offence of buggery and two concurrent sentences of two years for each of the attempted rapes. 
we here do not agree with concurrent sentencing, which means that they are both served at the same time, but they do at least go on top of the three years six months for buggery, which means his full sentence is five years and six months. We here at the Halls of Injustice, even with historical crimes, do not believe the sentence to be adequate. Justice may well have been served and yes he has been tarred, feathered and shamed for all eternity or for as long as he lives. The damage is lifelong, so we firmly believe in what I may have alluded to earlier, life and immediate castration. Now while this man still calls himself Lord and still has the right to that title, I do wonder if his cellmates will afford him the same courtesy. Anyway, as we are done with this, I'd very much like to know what you all think. Please do leave a like, because it helps the channel smash the comments. Yes, smash the comments. Leave a comment. Obligatory comment. If I don't see you on Twitch tonight, I hope you'll have a fantastic day, and thank you all very much for listening.